Hi everybody, Justin here from chemistrynotes.com and we're starting a brand new semester. So this is our second semester of notes and the first section or first chapter if you will is section 12 chemical kinetics. So the first semester covered sections 1 through section 11. Now we're going to start the second semester which will be sections 12 all the way through section 20. Okay, so this is video number one for section 12, chemical kinetics. So let's just get started. The top of page one of our notes here, it says section 12, chemical kinetics. Chemical kinetics is defined as the area of chemistry concerning reaction rates. Now, in the first semester of general chemistry, we learned how to write and balance chemical equations. And then we learned the new term, that term was stoichiometry, right? Stoichiometry is when we go from mass to moles, moles to mass, mass to molecules, moles to molecules, etc. And it was uh, start with what you're given and put it over one, right? So we did a lot of that in um, some of the mid to later sections of the first semester, but we never discussed how fast those reactions occurred. So let me just read this first paragraph here. In the first semester of general chemistry, we learned how to write and balance chemical equations. And using stoichiometry, we learned how to determine how much reactants were consumed and how much products were formed. But we learned nothing about how fast those chemical reactions or those chemical equations were occurring. We learned nothing about how fast they were occurring. And, and it's very important to know how long a reaction is going to take, because if it's going to take an infinite amount of time to take place, it's not going to be very useful to us. All right, why is chemical kinetics so important? Well, the spontaneity of a reaction, spontaneity of a reaction, we'll talk about this in section 16, what spontaneity is. But basically, a spontaneous reaction is a reaction that is going to occur in the direction that you want it to occur, but it doesn't really refer to how long it's going to take. So why is chemical kinetics so important? Well, the spontaneity of a reaction has nothing to do with how fast a reaction must occur. Second bullet point, while spontaneity refers to a reaction's tendency to occur, and again, I'll talk about that later on in section 16 when we talk about spontaneity, entropy, and free energy. While spontaneity refers to a reaction's tendency to occur, a reaction must occur at a reasonable rate in order for us to consider it to be a productive one or one that we can utilize. All right. As an example, the example I'm going to do is about the manufacture or the production of ammonia. Ammonia is NH3, right? So top of page two of our notes, here is the example I want to talk about. The example says 25 million tons of ammonia are produced annually. 25 million tons of NH3 ammonia are produced annually. The question then is how come ammonia or NH3 is not produced by the following inexpensive method, right? NH3 is made up of nitrogen and hydrogen, and those are both very plentiful molecules and they're relatively cheap. So the question sa says, how come ammonia is not produced by the following inexpensive, inexpensive method where the reactants N2 and H2 are cheap and readily available? And the reaction is, N2 gas plus 3 moles of H2 gas yields 2 moles of NH3 gas. All right, why isn't this the reaction that we use to produce that 25 million tons of ammonia annually in the United States? And that's an old number. It's probably more than 25 million tons now. Well, thermodynamically, this reaction is favorable at 25 degrees Celsius. In other words, this reaction will occur in the forward direction. It is spontaneous 
and it does take place all on its own. But thermodynamically, this reaction is favorable. However, the reaction rate is so slow. In other words, this reaction takes place so slowly over time that the two reactants essentially coexist indefinitely. It's like the N2 gas and the three moles of H2 gas are just sitting around and they're in it looks like they're never ever going to react. It just takes an inordinate or a ridiculously long amount of time for it to occur at regular conditions that we can control, namely 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so we have to come up with other methods that are more expensive. All right, the top of page three of our notes here is when I start to talk to you guys about reaction rates or the rate of a reaction. And if you look at the table, the table corresponds to the chart. Table 12.1 and figure 12.1 are related. We have a reactant, NO2, and as you can see, it's decreasing over time, while the two products, NO and O2, are increasing over time on that graph. You notice the O2 is only increasing half as fast, and that's because it is one mole in the balance equation, whereas NO2 uh, reactant and the 2NO product, those guys have coefficients of 2. So the O2 production is half as fast as NO production, and the O2 production occurs half as fast as the consumption of the reactant NO2. Okay, so that was a graph I wanted to show you on how that works. And the next page of our notes here, I want to start to get into reaction rate. Reaction rate is the change in concentration of reactant or reactants or product or products over time. So reaction rate, the change in concentration of reactants or products over time. Now in the reaction that I just showed you on the last page, that was where NO2 broke down or decomposed into NO plus O2. In the reaction on the last page, we have the following, and I'm just going to rewrite the uh, balanced equation, right? The balanced reaction. Two moles of NO2 gas yields two moles of NO gas plus O2 gas. All right, so we can take a look at the reaction rate in terms of the reactant or in terms of either product. It doesn't matter. So if we take a look at the reaction rate in terms of the reactant NO2, then the rate is minus the change in concentration of NO2 over time, over the change in time. The minus sign is because it's a reactant and NO2 is being consumed. Now I can also take a look in the middle box here that the reaction rate, I can take a look at it in terms of the production of my first reactant NO, where the rate is the change in concentration of NO over the change in time. Third box, the rate is equal to twice the change in concentration of O2 over time. Why, why is there a two on this in this third box, change of O2 concentration over time? Well, the two is there because only half as much of the oxygen is produced uh, relative to the production of NO or the consumption of the reactant NO2. So we have to put a two there in order to uh, make things work. So all those rates, those three boxes, are gonna be the same value because it's the same reaction. It's just, what perspective do you wanna take it from? And in, in my class and in most classes, we just we always take a look at reaction rate in terms of the consumption of the reactants. So we're gonna take a look at, take a look at it from the point of view of the reactant, which is, uh, decreasing over time. So in terms of that first box, so the reaction rate or rate can be written in terms of any of the reactants or in terms of any of the products, like I just mentioned. To be consistent, however, my notes and then in your course notes, it's customary to represent the reaction rate in terms of the consumption of the reactant. All right, so to be consistent, it's customary to represent the reaction rate in terms of the reactants. So moving to a new page of notes here, what can we say about that? What can we elaborate on? How can we further make sense of that? Well, 
of those three boxes on the last page, we're just going to focus on the first box, which is the one that I drew in terms of the reaction rate as it relates to the reactant. So the reaction rate is equal to minus the change in concentration of NO2 over time. And the minus is because uh, the reactants are being consumed and that concentration goes down over time. So if you refer back to page two of this video or uh, the second page of this video, you will see that in figure 12.1, right, we have the downward sloping uh, reactant concentration over time for NO2. So at any single point on that NO2 curve that was going down, we can calculate something called the instantaneous reaction rate. That means at that specific point on that curve for NO2, and that's the one that's sloping downwards, okay? Reactants are gonna decrease over time while our products increase over time. So at any single point on the NO2 curve, we can calculate the instantaneous rate of the reaction. So that's calculated by finding the slope of the line tangent to the curve at that particular point that you're interested in. So if you go back and look, you'll see that I've got a little dashed line rise over run, and I've drawn a tangent line to the curve at a random point on that curve where I want to find the instantaneous reaction rate. It's not an average, it's an instantaneous rate right then and there. So as an example, calculate the instantaneous rate of the reaction after 100 seconds has elapsed. So at time equals 100 seconds, right? I want to find out the instantaneous rate of the reaction at 100 seconds. Okay, at specifically 100 seconds, at specifically 100 seconds, I should say, what is the reaction rate at this time? So calculate the instantaneous rate of the reaction after 100 seconds has elapsed since the reaction started. Well, we've drawn a tangent to my curve at the x-axis t equals 100. So slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 from algebra. I plug in those values, right? Y2 minus Y1 is minus 0 0.0026. X2 minus X1 is 110 seconds. My slope is the, my instantaneous rate, okay? So the instantaneous rate is 2.36 times 10 to the minus fifth mole per liter per second. The minus sign is because this is a reaction rate where we are, it's decreasing over time, okay? Now, just a note for you here, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. I haven't actually drawn the coordinates x1, y1 or x2, y2. They're not shown in that graph, but you can see the rise over run that corresponds to that sample problem. All right, new example. New example, new page of notes. It says, now calculate the average reaction rate at which the NO2 concentration, that's my reactant. So it says, now calculate the average reaction rate at which the NO2 concentration changes over the, over the first 50 seconds of the reaction. Not at 50 seconds, but over the duration. That's an average reaction rate. You notice I've double underlined average reaction rate. That's to differentiate it from the last page of notes where we had instantaneous reaction rate. Instantaneous reaction rate, you draw a line tangent to that point at that specific time. Our example was 100 seconds. This question wants to know the average reaction rate between or spanning time zero seconds and time 50 seconds. If you go back to table 12.1 on the second page of this video, you will see it says in table 12.1, we have to consider the xy points at x equals zero seconds and x equals 50 seconds. So average reaction rate starts out a lot like instantaneous reaction rate where m, my slope, 
is equal to y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. If you look in table 12.1, you'll see that y2 is 0 0.0100 0 0 minus 0 0.0079 for y1. x2 minus x1 is 0 minus 50 seconds. If you do that math, you get an average reaction rate of minus 4.2 times 10 to the minus fifth mole per liter per second. All right, that's my reaction rate. That's concentration over time, right? That's what the units are. Mole per liter per second is a molar per second. So that's decreasing concentration over time. That's why there's a minus sign. This is being done in terms of reactants. Now, just a note here, reaction rate is not constant, but decreases over time as the reactant's concentration goes down, or in my particular example, as the reactant concentration goes down. We only have one reactant. And that should make sense. As you, as you lose more reactant, there's not as much reactant around, it's not going to decompose or break down or convert to products at the same pace as it would at time zero when you have as much of the reactant as you're ever going to have. So reactant, reaction rate is not constant but decreases over time as the reactant concentration goes down. In table 12.2, on the next page, this is going to be a new table, we'll see that the lesser the amount of reactant remaining, the slower the reaction rate becomes. All right, so you're going to see a new table here, table 12.2. I'm going to go ahead and hand draw this one for you. Um, I couldn't, there's no way I could hand draw the table and the figure 12.1 you saw on the second page of our notes today, but I can hand draw this one. So minus Delta NO2 over delta T. That's a funny looking uh, term for, I'm trying to label that first column there. That's actually the reaction rate. Minus the change of NO2 over the change of delta T. That's another way of me saying the reaction rate or the rate of this reaction. It's the change in concentration, right? Delta means change. The little triangle means change. It's minus the change in NO2 over time. Well, minus the change in NO over minus the change of NO2 over time, that's reaction rate. Okay, so from time period zero to fifty seconds, my reaction rate is four point two times ten to the minus fifth. We actually did that one, our last example problem. From time period fifty to one hundred seconds, the reaction rate is not as it's not as fast. Two point eight times ten to the minus five. All the way down at the bottom, 200 seconds to 250 seconds, further along in the reaction, right? The reaction rate is only 1.0 times 10 to the minus fifth relative to the very beginning of the reaction where the reaction rate was much faster. Okay, now that's all, that's today we just talked about the rate of a reaction and reaction rates and taking a look at the rate of a reaction from the perspective or in terms of the reactant. Right? In our reactant example, it was NO2. The next video concerns itself with something called rate laws, and there are two types of rate laws, and we'll talk about those in the next video. Okay?